Hi, my name is Bo McCall. Today is June the 2nd, 2023. Well, a few years ago, I was given the opportunity by a gentleman at Rutgers University to do a art book. And he showed me a series of books that had previously been done. They, they come in volumes. So the first volume is for artists, and you select whatever topic is that you like. And it's sold with the four artists. So the second volume, I'm a part of the second volume. I don't know if they started with the other three artists. So um, I was interested, and at the time, I hadn't a clue on what I was going to present, what I wanted to do, and I had a, a old bag of buttons, not buttons, photographs from years gone by of all of my friends and all the good times we had back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, what have you. And occasionally, I just revisit the bag for memory purposes and, you know, just to reminisce on old times. And then something clicked in my head and said, well, why don't you use this as a topic and pay tribute to some of my friends that I lost years gone by. So that's how it started. So it was during COVID. I think I had about six months to create collages and I had never done physical collages before and I didn't want to use the physical button because when I do my work with the actual button, it can take months and months, maybe years um, to produce a piece. And in the process of um, producing these pieces, I always take reference shots of the pieces that I'm working on. So whether I'm taking it for color combinations, the type of thread I'm using, the type of buttons I'm using, I take all these little shots and I just follow. So when the collage started, I went back to re revisit all these little clips and pieces that I was using. So I incorporated them in, with the actual photographs to make the collages. So, like I said, it was my first foray, so I really didn't know what I was doing, to be honest. <laughs> so, it was a lot of trial and error, but I finally got the gist of it, and I uh, completed it about, I think I completed 50 collages. So, they just get getting better and better, right? And um, it was about 10 of my friends, 10 of my closest friends, early on in my young life that left a lasting impression on me and it's part of who I am today because of them. So that's how it started. My gay life and taking part in gay lifestyle started in the late 70s, around 77. Um, we all lived in the same neighborhood maybe one, two, three block radius from each other. Um, and this particular group, I think it's about five of them, up the street, down the street, up the block, what have you. And we just sort of, you know, your gay dog go up and, you know, we belong together. So we all form these relationships and form these bonds. Um, it was Tracy, Antoine, those are my two very closest friends. Um, and then, we all had big families. Our, all our families um, was very accepting of who we were and who we thought we were going to be. Um, it was only one incident with Antoine's grandmother. Myself and another friend of mine, we went to Antoine's house to meet up and go hang out. We were sitting in his living room and his grandmother came in. She spoke and he was in the bedroom and we heard her in the bedroom saying, what are these faggots doing in my living room? <laughs> so, of course, we got real tense and nervous, like, oh my God, like, is she gonna throw us out? Or what's gonna happen, right? So she never came back out the room, and he came back out, and he was like, you know, we gotta go, we gotta go. So we got, we left. And maybe as, as time went on, her name was Pauline, and then I thought it was odd that he called his mother and his grandmother by their first name. 
so when we got formally introduced to Pauline, um, it was like, oh, Miss Pauline, she said, no, call me Pauline. So, you know, as time went on, we developed a relationship with her. Um, I brought to her attention what she had did. She was in total denial, like she never said it. And I'm like, okay, well, let's let's just move forward. But it was big hugs. We all, all our families, we got along with each other. Um, Tracy had a large family. I think it was like maybe nine of them. Um, her mother, Miss Middleton. Miss Middleton was a sweetheart. Um, I love that lady to death. She she taught me how to make um, this chili that I still make today. And then um, it was my mom, and they all like my mom because my mom was my mom was like the diva, you know. Um, so we um, we just bonded. We just clicked. It was just something about us. So then we had uh, Ma Renee, which lived a couple blocks who went to school with Antoine. So I met Renee from Antoine. And Ant, um, Renee was, um, he was very animated. Like when he came down the block, you knew he was coming down the block. Right, he had a big personality. Um, I could see him now, we used to go to this club called the Olympia. And before MC Hammer came out, he had those, he called them drum pants that, that Hammer used to wear. Uh, he made him out of sweat, sweat material. We were in the club, and he just was spinning like a spinning top all over the club. I was like amazed, right? And he was very creative. Um, he was Jamaican, and he had this certain kind of the way he would walk. He had this certain kind of glide when he came in the room. Like he would own the room. If he walked in here right now. Everybody would stop with what, what they're doing and just, who is this, who is this, who is this? He's one of those kind of people. Um, I just recently found out that he went to Alvin Ailey and he had one of those dancers' bodies, the legs, the, the chest, the tight waist. He was one of those people. And him and myself, we were supposed to move to New York after we got out of high school. But he was more adventurous than I was. I was like, so where are we going to live? Where are we going to work? Like, how are we going to survive? He was like, no, just come on, just go. It's New York. We're going to have some fun. I'm like, I'm not going. So he left, and I stayed behind. So um, Antoine and Tracy, we were influenced by the punk stuff that was coming in, right? And we formed a band called Strange Beauties, and we wrote and sung about all the stuff that we were doing, and um, all the things that we were being influenced by. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this thing called AIDS came. And in the beginning, nobody paid attention. It was like, oh, you know, the white guys are getting, the white boys are getting this, you know, it's, it's not about us, it's not about us. So, you know, each city, everybody has a small community of gays. So everybody pretty much knows each other or knows of each other. So people just started dying. Young people, people that were younger than we were. They just were dropping like flies. Then we started paying attention, okay? And then it seemed like it was getting everybody's click, but nobody close to us. It was people that we knew of, but we just didn't know. And then all of a sudden, Antoine got AIDS. So I'm, I'm in New York and I go home and I went to visit and I go to his house and it was just something strange about this particular day. It was it in the evening, so it was at nighttime. So I go in, his mother was there, his grandmother was there. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Oh, house in New York, blah, 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 whatever. And so Antoine will be now in a minute. They were watching TV and all the lights in the house were off. So I thought it was kind of odd that they didn't turn the lights on. So he came downstairs and we sat in the dining room. The lights were dim. So I said, I have something to tell you. So I'm thinking, he's, you know, we just catching up on dirt and who's this, that, and the other, whatever. And he said, oh, I have AIDS. And I just looked at him and you could, I felt like part of me had died right then and there. Like I just lost it. 
and he said to me, he said, um, he said, I cried enough for all of us. So don't don't cry for me. I'm I'm fine. I'll be fine. Whatever, right? So um, I went home, and my mom was there. One of my aunts was there, and you know everybody knew everybody. So I said, you know, Antoine just told me he had AIDS. I think I must have cried all night. So that was um, the first person that I really knew that died from AIDS, and I we did everything under the sun together. Right, and I watched him. He had like a like a Flintstone kind of body. He was had a real long torso, like short on the bottom, nice cute little butt, nice legs, and he had his own hair. He had a head full of his own hair, and I just watched him wither away, just like right before me. And I remember the last time I went to see him in the hospital. We all love Patty LaBelle. And I said, I said, well, you want me to play some Patty songs for you? He said, no. He said, I have to get Patty up. I have to let her go. So I said, okay. And, you know, I hugged him and everything. And he, he had this, like, uh, this glare in his eyes that I will never forget. And I was like, okay. This is it. I knew that right then and there that that was going to be the last time that we communicated with each other in the flesh. And a couple of days later, he was gone. And then, oh, him and Tracy was feuding at the time. So when I would come back and forth, she would always say to me, what did he say? What did he say? What did he say? I said, I think you better call him. I think you better talk to me. You know, you don't need to hash this out before it's too late. And they had their words, and it was over. But I was devastated. We both, both were devastated. We, you know, we went to the funeral. And after that, it wasn't the same. Because it was the three of us. Everywhere we went, if it wasn't all three, it was one or two. That we were all together all the time. Um, as far as my gay life and gay experience, um, I probably experienced everything with them too. First, going to gay clubs together, um, just hanging out with cruising boys and drinking, smoking, just the whole gamut of just living a gay lifestyle. Because we were, we were like in our late teens. Um, and then a lot of things, you know, we were very naive about and then um, it was this older guy, this older man that we used to hang around. And I was a little more intuitive than them. I felt like he was trying to live through us. And he was would tell us stories about his past and how he survived. But not to say it didn't help us. We were in an entirely different era the whole gamut of how people lived changed because he, he came from like maybe the 50s. So all that hiding and all that stuff, we didn't know anything about that. We just flew out the closet. You know, like these little spring chickens and we were just having a good time and thought the world wasn't going to end. Um, then there was Joey. And I met Joey from my friend Trey. And Joey actually went to Bethune-Cookman. And um, he was a DIY Ward freak. Oh, God. But when we go to Joey's house, you couldn't play no other music except for DIY Ward. And maybe Whitney Houston, because they're related in some kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> and he had, a, he had a big family, too. Um, his mother was, everybody's mom was really nice. Um, and nobody knew anybody's fathers? Um, his father was around, you know, the dads would be, you know, would go upstairs, like a couple times, my dad would be there and be just like, hey, and just go upstairs, like no communication. You know, sometimes I'll just be like, like, can you talk to these people? Like, we human. So with Joey, um, what did he he wanted to get into politics. And I was saying to him, I said, Well, you know, we doing 
drag and all this kind of stuff, this is going to come back to haunt you if you attempt to do some drag shit. Um, so he started doing drag. Um, out of all of us that did drag, I was the best looking one. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, God. I don't think drag was for him. It just... Oh, and how we met, Trey said to me, it's this queen downtown that has beautiful legs better than yours. And I was like, nobody has better legs than me. <laughs> so we came out, I met him, and I was like, oh, you're the one they said that they got the nice legs. Let's see your legs. <laughs> so I said, oh, they're all right, you know, da, 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 whatever, right? So, we instantly, we just bonded, right? So we were the one with, we had the legs. Um, he was another one. He had like an athletic body. He probably could have been like a, a football player. Very masculine body. That's why I couldn't understand why he wanted to do drag. It just, it didn't work for me. But that's what he wanted to do. That was his life and that's what he did. So that was Erica World. Erica Diani world for Dion Warwick. And um Did he ever do politics? He was about he was became the committee person in his na his neighborhood. But soon after that, he got it. And the thing with him is he never said it. He never verbally said it to us. He said, Because I have what I have. And um again I Watched him just wither away. And then Trey and myself went to visit him at his house. At his mom's house, rather. And he had all this stuff on his night table. And he asked Trey to pass him. I don't know what it was. And Trey picked it up. And he got poked with a needle. So he didn't show any reaction then. But when we got out and we left, he was like, I just got poked with a, with a needle. And that like destroyed it. Cause he was like, did he do it on purpose? And I'm like, why would he do something like that? So he went and got checked and he, he was fine. And then shortly after that, he was gone. Then, um, who else? Cypher Dean. Cypher Dean was a character. <laughs> Cypher Dean was a character. Um, he did all kind of seedy, unmentionable things, um, but he was fun. Because <laughs> he, before I landed in New York, he came up with this idea. He said, well, we should all move to San Diego. And then a couple of weeks prior to that, he told us he went to Paris. Well, I'm like, how did you go to Paris? And he actually went to Paris. He had some kind of airline scheme or whatever, and he went to Paris. He said, oh, just pack your bags. We'll go to, uh, we'll go to San Diego or San Francisco or whatever. So I said, okay. And Tracy was in a relationship with this guy. And instead of Tracy just saying, I'm going to stay here with my boyfriend, y'all two go ahead. She just led us to believe that she was going to go with us. So the day that it was time for us to leave, she didn't show up. I was like, well, leave her. Because I'm ready. I got my bags back. And my mother used to call Cypher Dean Magic. He was very colorful and, you know, had this big personality. And um, we go to the, the airport. And this fool is dressed like magic, like a magician or something. So, we, you know, we go through all the process. And whatever he was doing, it didn't work. Then he had a cat. I'm like, whatever you don't, why would you bring a cat? <laughs> right? So we went twice, and the second time, it didn't work. And I had my bags packed for maybe a week or two. So um, I met this guy in New York in a train station. And he said to me, because every time I would come to New York, he said to me, oh, if you ever want to come and stay with me, you can stay with me. But you know, I was young and I was all over the place. So I told Cypher Dean, I said, drop me off at Penn Station because I got somewhere to go because I'm not going back home. And I got to Penn Station, I called the guy up, 
And he said, okay, um, let me know get here and I'll meet you. So we met and um, he was like a, a He had something to do with law enforcement. He had a gun, he had a badge and all that stuff, but I don't think he was an actual cop. And um, at the time, he was a navigator for Greyhound Bus. So he would do all their maps and all that kind of stuff. So I got to his house, and I think I might have been around 26 or 27. But I could still pass for like maybe 18 or 19. So he thought like I was this little kid. And he was like, did you call your mother? Did you do this? Did you do that? And I'm like, like, I'm a grown man. Like, you know, I can survive. I can handle myself. And um, at that point, I was used to like my peers and dealing with guys who were my own age. I knew nothing about older men. And he treated me like a kid, and I didn't like it. And um, the communication was off. You know, I knew nothing about drinking, cooking, n none of that stuff. He went to work. He said, well, you know, fix dinner, whatever. I'm like, fix dinner? Like, it was a disaster. <laughs> then he wanted me to, you know, fix some cocktails and stuff. A disaster. So I'm like, no, you know, I don't think this is going to work. And then I had never been intimate with somebody older. And I was like, disgusted. <laughs> I was so disgusted. So we're in bed. Oh my God. He's like kissing all over me and stuff. I was like, oh, oh God. So I said to him, I said, do me a favor. He said, what? I said, roll over, roll over there. So he rolled over. So when he rolled over, I rolled the opposite and rolled myself up in the blankets. <laughs> I said, now roll back over. <laughs> <laughs> so he just looked at me like this is it for you you're a smart ass right so we got up that morning and he was like you know it was really nice seeing you I enjoy myself so on so on so on so on and no more words after that I took my shower I cleaned up and we were in Jersey we were in Newark I had no idea how to get back to, to New York so I just followed him on the on the, on the bus. No more words spoken. And I just vanished. He vanished. And I never saw him again. Well, for me, um, and I'm going to take you back to my childhood. I was very introverted. Um, both, I had two brothers. Both my brothers, very athletic, very outgoing. Um, I'm the oldest, so I was very quiet. And I was always somewhere in the corner creating something, making something. So while they were dribbling basketballs and throwing footballs and shit, I was somewhere in the corner doing macrame or making some paper mache kind of stuff. Um, and then I wasn't very social because I grew up in the projects. So it was just the people that were in the building that I associated with. Where my middle brother, a lot of people thought he was the oldest. Because he was out and about, he socialized, everybody knew him. Everybody knew him. Even if um, if we were running to people, they'd be like, oh, that's, they'll say that's Bo, Guy's brother, not that's Guy, Bo's brother. So it was like, he was the starter, I wasn't. So I got, I got in high school and I met this girl, we're still, we're still best friends getting back to friendships. We're still friends today. And her and her friend that she used to be with, they used to watch me, but I never knew they was watching me. So, you know, I used to get dressed up to go to school. Like I was going to church or something. Like, so every day be done. And she came to me one day. She said, oh, we watch you every day. You wear different shoes every day. You had this on one day. You had that one one day. Like, are they stalking me or whatever? She said, you're going to be with us. So the guy that I was hanging with from junior high school, I said to Jerry, I said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to start having some fun. And I stopped hanging around him. And then when I started hanging with her, she knew everybody. If we went anywhere, if it was 100 people, she knew 99 people. 
if it was 10 people, she knew 11 people. She knew everybody. And then she lived across the street from a, um, a bus depot. So she knew all the bus drivers. So we, we, she had stacks of bus passes in her pocketbook. And she was a graffiti artist. <laughs> so we'd be anywhere. We'd be walking down the street and she'd have her pocketbook and she would just pull a can of um, um, spray paint out and just write cupcake on the wall. What's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? Shut up! <laughs> and that was naive. Whatever she told me, I just did it. And I learned a lot, and I'm still learning a lot from the early relationship, because I said to her one day, I said, oh, I have something to tell you, but I don't know how you're going to take it. She's like, well, what is it? Just say it. Just say it. I'm crying. I'm falling out. She was like, just say it. Say it. Say it. I said, I'm gay. She said, oh, tell. Come on, we got your son. So, so. <laughs> so, you know, our relationship, it never changed. It's, it stays the same. So she owns a funeral business. And she's doing very well. I saw her um, for my birthday. So the relationship, it continued. But what I learned from her and all the time, before I got into my, my, my gay life, I was around a lot of women. And I tell Solio now, I said, the women love me. I don't know what it is. And I met her and several women throughout my life to take me from point A to point B. And then, you know, I had the youth factor working for me. I was like, oh, that's, oh, he's sweet. He's this, he's that. Bring him along, bring him along, bring him along. Come here. So I used that to my advantage. Now with her, she was the type of person, she's very aggressive. She's a go-getter. Um, and she wasn't afraid. Like, everything with me, I was had this shield up. I was always afraid of how I was going to be perceived and what people want to say about me. She didn't care. She was just, just tell it, come on, let's go. And I just, I would follow her. Um, then with getting dressed, I found out early on, like they were dancers. They did a lot of socializing. I was the sidekick. I was the person that if we went to a party, I had 50 coats in my hand, holding everybody's coat. No conversation. I was like, oh, that's fine. Whatever. Um, what did she do? Oh, so the only thing they would do with me is, oh, he dressed nice. He, he, he really dresses nice. So I had to make that work to my advantage. So they would come to me because I look good. Because I presented well. So then gradually I started coming out of my show. And then um, it took it took time, but it was a, I was a work in progress. And then by the time I got to my gay friends, it was like a, just a remnant shadows of that other person started to disappear because I started have more confidence in myself. And, more and you weren't protecting yourself anymore. Yes. You were out. Yes, I was out, and I just let everything go. Um, and then the drag thing, um, Tracy ended up becoming trans. The way I explain um, my existence in drag is I was expressing my artistic behavior. Because all the drag queens we were around, they were like pageant girls and glamour girls. That's not what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a rock star. So that's what I look like with the hair and the, the leopard and the fishnet stockings and whatever Deborah Harry had on. That's what I wanted to look like. So when they would see us, they were like, here come the strange beauties, here come the rock girls. <laughs> so we got a big kick out of that. But I knew for me, it was gonna be temporary. Like once it wore off, I want no parts of it. And then I felt like if I, had been addicted to anything, it would have been makeup. Because I still love makeup. Oh my God. I used to be in, in my mother's house when I was still in the house. Oh, it might be like two or three o'clock in the morning, lock the door in the bathroom, and I would have Essence magazines. And I used to have these 
do's and don'ts on how to apply makeup. <laughs> so, you know, I know what I was doing. So I was like, oh, well, this is don't because, you know, I just fucked this eyeliner up. And I look at the picture and I'm just studying. And then I learned all my little tricks because they wore makeup, but they, it wasn't creative. Um, and then, you know, I like people like Grace Jones and um, Donna Ross. I would watch how these women put their makeup on. So I was addicted to eyeliner. So, you know, um, after they saw me, you know, like when we would first started going out and drag, they would never say, like, well, who's your ugly friend? Which would be me. <laughs> they wouldn't even acknowledge me. I said, I'm going to get you bitches back. So after I learned my craft and we started going out, they're like, who did your eye? Who did this? Who did, what's this color from? I'm like, uh, you gotta learn it. So, um, we would, we would listen to oldies and we were influenced by punk and girl groups. Cause when we put our makeup on, we would listen to like the Shangri-Las, listen to all the Motown girls, the Ronettes. It'd just be strictly girl groups and rock. And then we listened to, well, I listened to this radio station called WKDU, which was a college station that on the weekends, they only played punk music. And when I heard it, I was like, y'all gotta listen to this shit. Like, this is really good. We, I think we can do this. <laughs> so we did it. You know, um, like getting back to the friendship and, and building characters, we all had our own strengths and we all had our own flaws like um tracy was a hustler tracy could to take a dollar and make a hundred dollars out of it take a hundred dollars and make a thousand dollars the only downfall tracy had was tracy didn't know what to do do with the money so half of the time she just give the money away or just spend it on junk or we go to the corner store and, and she put like a thousand dollars out of her pocketbook to buy soda. I'm like, why are you doing that? Well, me on the other hand, I like things and nice stuff. So I will go shopping. I want to buy shoes. I want to buy all the latest whatever. I want to go to sales. I want to go to the thrift shop. I'll just spend the money up. So you can go to Tracy anytime and say, give me a hundred dollars, give me this set. And she had it. She would give it to you. Um, Antoine was more adventurous. He was more street than the, the both of us. Like I said, we did everything under the sun. And I remember he went out with this man one night. And so I said, well, well what happened? Oh, he gave me money. That bitch would be lying all the time. So she ended up taking the man's money. So I said, well, what happened? So they did a little thing. And she said, the man went to sleep. And Antoine was like, I had my heels and everything was at the door already. I had everything set up. I was just waiting for him to go to sleep. And he would just come back like nothing ever happened. And, you know, just pull these little stunts where part of me, I guess I would get that from my mom too. I wanted to be seen a certain way. I wanted to be respected. I wanted to... Um, did you want, want to respect yourself? Of course, that's first. And then I wanted to be refined. Even though like I look like a rock star, I still wanted to be elegant and prissy. Because in the beginning, I didn't want to be a woman. I wanted to be a girl. So they used to laugh at me because I used to have these little ruffled blouses and the little ruffled socks and the patent leather shoes with the bows. And stuff like, nobody's going to want you with that shit on. Why do you keep wearing that stuff? You gotta put some boobs on, you gotta do this. I was like, I don't want that. You know, I wear little, little doll baby dresses and all that kind of stuff. Until it just, I just wanted to be sexy after that. That wore off. And, um, I think, and then after that, then this, um, Bianca was, Bianca was trans. And it was this boy, I think his name was Seville. We all knew Seville. He ended up murdering her. Um, how can I describe Bianca? Bianca was younger than us. 
because by this time we might have been 22, 23, Bianca probably was like 17, 18, something like that. It's like a big, tall doll, about six foot, little chinky eyes. Um, I can remember she had these cute little hands. And um, at this particular night, I didn't go out. And when they came home, they said, oh, we got something to tell you. I was like, what happened? They said, oh, you know, Bianca got murdered. And that was another one. Um, it was because she was so young. Like, she didn't really get a chance to experience life. And then the, the guy, he was young, too. I don't know. I don't know what happened, how they, the paths crossed or what, what started it. I just felt really bad because she didn't get a chance to be do the, the, the dirty 20s thing. Not dirty 30s, but she didn't get a chance to just experiment with her 20s. You know what I'm saying? So that was another thing. And then um, two of my other friends, they had diabetic comas. Um, Charles, I had a picture of Charles when I started the project. And he gave me this picture, and I lost the picture. I don't. I still don't know where the picture is. It's probably in my house somewhere. And he's the only one that doesn't have a picture to represent the project. Um, Charles, he was younger than me too. He was the one. They said, "Oh, we met this little queen. He looks just like you. He looks like he could be your brother." So I'm like, "I don't well, got two brothers. I'm not claiming nobody else." And when we he says when we met each other, he said I had some rock star outfit on, and he said I had a boombox blasting Blondie. And he was coming this direction, I was coming that direction, and it was like, this is Charles, that's above. And we just looked at each other, started laughing, and it was just, that was it. We became friends. But boy, could he sing. I mean, really sing. Like, the, what we were doing, that wasn't singing. But he was a singer, singer. He sound, he sound like the male version of, of Phil Hyman. Very jazz influenced. Um, another that was a to me that was a great loss because no telling where he would be right now because he had talent, talent, and then he was he was a cutie. He was really really cute, like a little kid, adorable. So he could have just capitalized off of that alone before he opened his mouth to sing. Um, I think Charles, he might have been in, he might have been in his late twenties, and his parents went away from the weekend, and when they came back, they found him dead. So it was that, and then Trey, same thing. Um, I was supposed to go home to Philly that weekend, and then our friend Jimmy, Jimmy was in D.C. So I was like, no, Jimmy, you go, and then I'll come the following day. So Jimmy went, and he said he got up, he went to walk the dog, did, Sammy is the dog, he walked, walked Sammy, did the whole thing. You know, it was like a little ritual, you go there. And he said Trey was in the room, he never came out the room. I'm fixing breakfast, get up, da, 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 da. He said, he goes in the room, he's gone. But that one, Trey was crazy. We, we were um, very much into music. Um, if you went to Trey's apartment, whoever you liked, whoever she liked, whoever they liked, we'd be out CD shopping, that's what we did. He would say, oh, Robert likes share and so and so and so, so he get all share. I'm like, why are you buying it? It's because when Robert comes over, he, he'll have something to listen to. So he had racks, like we were in a music store in his room, one of his rooms. It was just racks and racks of CDs all over the place. That's how much he loved music. And then he had a voice similar to Sylvester and Nick Ashford. So we would be walking down the street, he would just start howling and screaming like he was in church or something. He was just, he was comical as hell. And um, he called himself the doll, Lickyella. Lickyella Munyega. 
and um, one time he called me collect, and um, the operator said, "What's your name?" He said, "Licky Ella." She didn't want to say Licky Ella. He said, "Lick, Licky Ella, Lick." She said, "It's uh, 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 uh
you know, I'll go with the flow. He's like, no, we're not going with the flow. This is the flow that we're going to go with. This is what you're going to do. So I think, um, well, matter of fact, I know he's has a lot to do with where I am in my place in the art world right now. Because a minute ago, nobody knew who Bo McCall was or is. Now, I have, um, I have sort of a following. People know who I am. Um, not the masses, but I do have people, oh, that's Bo McCall, oh, that's the button man, that's the button man, that's the button man. And a lot of it is him. And we both play on a equal, playing field. Um, I don't get in his way. He don't get in my way. Um, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> when we sign on to do whatever it is, we always see it through. The only thing he does to me is um, like I'm working on some, some projects now. Is that going to be ready? I'm like, have, I've reached all of my deadlines. Like, you don't have to pressure me to produce and he's not producing the actual objects so you're not hands on so you really don't know the process of what I'm doing you think you know but you don't so he's a wordsmith so I don't interfere with it like when we sit down and we talk about what we're going to do and we talk about explaining and describing what it is that I do. I don't just go along with it because he's a good writer. I'm like, no, that's not what I meant. That's not what I said. And this is how I said it and this is what it means. So it's, 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 it's a trade of energies as far as the works are. Very, very much organized. In, in the house, I'm organized confusion. But everybody that we've worked with from the very beginning up until now, everybody says the same thing. He's very organized. So if you say, uh, uh, we're gonna do such and such tomorrow at 10 o'clock, he's, he's gonna call you, he's gonna be there, he's gonna call you on everything. And he's always prepared. We'll meet people, the other, we met somebody the other night about uh, doing the placement. He said, he didn't call me back. He didn't call me back. He didn't call me back. I, well, I, I gave him my card. He had a conversation with him. He didn't respond to him, but he responded to me. <laughs> and then he'll say, well, what, it is, what is it about you? I'm like, well, I'm an artist. That he's like fearless fly. Like he, let, he lets nothing get in his way. He, um, he sees everything through from the beginning to end, no matter how much turmoil is involved, how complicated it is, he always sees it to the finish line. Um, and if he says that he's gonna do something, nine times out of 10, it's done as, as we speak. Well, he's gonna lie, but <laughs> when we first met, um, you could, I could see that he had some kind of potential because I said to me, I said to him all the time, you're beautiful. Like, a lot of stuff that you do, you don't have to do it because you, you, you got the look. People are going to look at you regardless. So he went out. In the beginning, I used to, you know, style him and put him in a little stuff. This, you look like this person. They'll take you serious. And I, I forget the last event he went to. It was something that was really conservative, but something eye catching. And he came back that night and he was like, I think I got it. And then from there, the beast came out. <laughs> like, um, I think what he does, he carries very well. Um, he's very confident. He's very, he's self-assured. So to me, when, when you're out and you dressed in some of this outlandish, some of the stuff that we wear, you gotta have confidence. Cause you're gonna get all kind of hooks and nails. And I've been through that. I've been through people throwing bottles of shit at me walking down the street. 
He don't see it. He don't hear it. It's like he's very secure in who he is. That's what I love about him. Um, that he's able to see his way through. Through the weeds. I think he vibes off my creativity. And then a lot of times he'll say to me, like he'll get dressed and I look at him and say, been there, done that. Like, <laughs> them twice your age. I done seen all this stuff before. But you didn't see it like this. I still seen it before. So, um, I'll say, oh, you know, you copy this, I did this, or I did that, or you're, you're always paying attention to what I'm doing or what I'm putting on or how I'm presenting myself. And he always say, oh no, it's inspiration. It's, I'm not copying, it's inspiration. It's inspiration. And I think that he, he trusts my judgment and he, um, he knows that I have experience, more life experience that I'm just able to just be me and not give a damn. Cause you know, as you get older, you got all this, <laughs> you got all this, this history before you that brings you to the present. And some of that stuff is just life on repeat, life on repeat, life on repeat. It just keeps happening over and over again. So when it happens the second time, you know how to deal with it. So even if you fail, you still know how to correct the failure because you're repeating, life just goes on. You may stay the same, but all the players are changed, but it's the same scenario. You know what I mean? And he's still going through that. Um, certain situations will happen, happen like when he's doing work things. I'm like, some stuff you gotta let go. Cause you're gonna get stressed, you're gonna get a line, you're gonna get a wrinkle, you're gonna get this, you're gonna do this. Relax. Relax. And everything is... I'm not on that frequency anymore. Um, when we met, we met on social media, right? He said I was harassing him, but we had maybe like two or three conversations, right? So I, I went to meet him, and it was the first time that I actually met somebody online that it wasn't about sex. So we went out, we went to the park and you know, we just started talking about each other, telling each other, each other's background, this, that, and the other. And you know, when I saw him and I saw the smile, that was it for me, you know, I love it. Beautiful smile, beautiful skin, beautiful body, blah, blah, blah. So we're sitting in the park, we're talking and he, he had to interview some celebrities this particular day. So he said, well, I'm getting ready to go interview so-and-so. And then he went and this little bag that he was carrying, he pulled out this makeup mirror. It was disgusting. <laughs> it was disgusting, right? So he goes into the restaurant and he said, you know, give me a couple minutes and I'm going to do this interview. And I saw while well, I wait for you across the street in this store. So I go in the store and posing around and they had these little compact mirrors and I bought him a fresh mirror. I said, you you can't do what you do and pull that little nasty little thing out of your bag. <laughs> so it started like that. And then we never separated from that day. It just, he would come over, he lived, he lived not far from me, and he would come over every day. And then he started leaving things behind. <laughs> and I said to him, oh, you forgot your shirt, or you, you didn't get your socks, or whatever. He said, oh, no, I'll just get it when I come back. I'll just get it when I come back. I said, oh, yeah, okay. So about, maybe about a year, year and a half in, he moved in. And I tell him, and I tell people all the time, that I waited half of my life for him to show up. Um, I, I just feel like we complement each other. I think, um, I only consider myself having two really legit relationships. Not to say all the other stuff, but all the other stuff didn't count. Um, I don't think they really got the gist of who I am as a person and as a creative person. Because all my life, even with my friends, why are you making that? Why are you doing this? What is that? And the only time they would really pay attention is when they would see the finished product. 
but the process, nobody got the process. It's like, why are you sitting in the house? We could be out in the club, we could be doing this, that, and the other, and you sitting around sewing buttons or making flowers or whatever it is that I was doing at the time. But then when they would see the finished piece, I was like, oh, okay, and can you make me one? That, but he got it right off. And he would see me make stuff. He was like, can you make me one? And then he's the perfect model. You know, so I would make him one and we go go out and he would promote whatever it is that I was doing. And he was, so my partner, this is Bo, he made this and model, and, you know. So it started like that and just, I, just, I love his energy. Now that's not to say that, um, that some days the energy level is too high. <laughs> <laughs> and you know once he's up here it's kind of hard to bring him back down so then you know I just get really subdued and then he'll see it he's like is everything is everything okay with us is everything okay with us I'm like everything is fine oh I will tell him how much I love him I always tell him I love him like on a daily basis. Um, for me with him, it was like what I thought the first time was gonna be when you fall in love. Like when you fall in love and you get your heart broke, you never forget the, the first time. But all after the first time, it's, it's not the same because you, you know what it is, right? Him, like, when we have our differences, you know, sometimes it's a day or two, but we always come back to the front and center. To We come back to us. You know, and it's always a, us first. You know, even when we're out or... Oh, somebody, somebody um, that he, he knows from being a journalist, and um, he, she said to him, are you still with that old man? So you know I don't like her. <laughs> Are you you still with that old guy? You still with that old man? You know, so it sometimes it's a lot of that stuff, but I I don't I don't care. And then, you know, I feel like we're we're lucky to have each other. Cause it's, you know, no telling where he could have ended up at. Um, he, you know, told me some of his uh previous relationships that not they weren't as bad as mine, but they could be. You know, so it's just life. I just think that um, we found each other in the right moment. What I find is, and I used to say this early on, and people didn't really didn't get what I was saying. Um, I used to always say, it's one thing to look like a fag, and it's another thing to act like a fag. Right? And I think when you you act and you everything's over dramatized over larger than life a lot of people can't connect with that and that's a turn off for the average person but I think if you come in a room just as you are because a lot of people say that's who they are for me even creating a, a drag persona that's somebody I created Right, so I don't think you wake up like that every day. Um, I just think it's how we, we navigate ourselves in spaces and the respect that we demand. Even though sometimes it looks like we done jumped off the moon or whatever, whatever, but I think people, they respect us. And then, um, you know, when they look at our background and the things that we're doing, it's like, Applause! Oh my God, they're doing some things. They're not just in the moment. This is what I told somebody. Uh, this is one of my exes. Right? We, he was somewhere, and he said he was walking down the street. And, you know, they called him a bunch of fags or whatever. And I said, "Are are you a fag?" So I was like, "No." I was like, "So why did you respond to it?" Like, I don't respond to stuff like that. I brace myself because anything could happen. But I'm not going to turn around and engage you with that. Because when you engage, you open up the door. You don't know God knows what could happen. So I think, I think it's that. 
And I think it's the way you, your posture and how you present and walk through the world and the spaces. Cause I've, I tell a story, um, I was in North Philly. North Philly is really rough, the part of town where I was at this particular night. I had my best rock star drag on. <laughs> and I'm coming down the street and then, you know, on the East Coast, on the, on the weekend, on a sad Friday or Saturday night, the streets are packed. I'm in an area that I'm not fam familiar with. And it's got to be like, I walked through at least 50 guys before I got through the corner. And I was like, hey girl, hey sister, hey something, 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 something. But I know from women that um, sometimes women, men give women a bad rap when they don't respond to them. So you know, I got my best, <laughs> my best voice out. And they let me go through with no problem. So again, it's like how you navigate the space. Because we could have been somebody else if it had been a totally different thing. And trust me, them guys, they look like they would have did some damage to me. But I made it through. And I'm, I'm still making it um, through life. That's not to say that, you know, I don't have challenges every now and then. I would like to have some kind of name recognition because I don't I don't have that. Like when I do these shows, whatever, and they say, oh, well, you know, invite your following, da, da, da. I don't have that. I would like to be in a space and I'll come back here in five years and you, you say, Bo McCall is going to be here and like 100 people show up. That. I think I'm working very, very hard to um, leave a lasting legacy. Um, but I think for me, with my own personal art, it's ultimately about my life experiences. Because a lot of times when I'm doing group shows and we do these panel discussions and I listen to how a lot of other artists explain their work, some of that stuff, I don't, I can't grasp. And I'm not taking anything away from them because that's their experience. That's not my experience. But a lot of this stuff sounds a bit far-fetched to get somebody to be interested in something that you're doing, right? Because it's, it's times, like I'm, when I'm working on a piece and I know exactly what I'm doing, I may not know what the, the finished piece is going to look like, but I have an idea of where I'm going. And then with, with the uh, remains, before I go to the next piece, I got to rest my hands. And then the scraps, I'm just experimenting, making stuff out of whatever's laying on the floor. Early on, um, we're just like small groups of friends was observing the work. And they, a, a lot of folks was like, oh, you, you remind me of Andy Wall. Like, not Andy, no. Like, I just have Andy. And da, 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 da. But I really love Andy and his work. But I think the similarity in what we're doing is a lot of stuff that I'm doing, I'm remixing. Like the clothing I'm doing is something that's been created, that I'm recreating. I'm putting my own spin on, I'm putting my own story on. So I think in that way we parallel. Because what he was doing, I don't think none of it was new. I mean, you take a Campbell's soup can and you just put your spin on the can. When I, when I did my tub, um, I forget who. Somebody came to interview us, uh, Associated Press. So we were in like maybe a, 150 outlets across the world. And I really, we never had that much press before. And I started reading the comments, which I never, never did. So somebody said, a bathtub covered in buttons. Where the fuck is art going to? What is this? So... You know, I clenched up like this, like, like they're talking about me. <laughs> they're talking about my work. I sat here for almost a year to produce this piece, and they don't like it. And then I, you know, it was like a minute or two, and then I got over it. And I was like, oh, it's not for them. Because everything I do, I do it for me first. It's not like I'm um, creating for a particular audience. When, when I first got to New York, and I'm 
got involved with the Black Fashion Institute, I was really intimidated because all the designers there, and I didn't consider myself a designer, I considered myself an artist. They were making things from scratch. I was embe embellishing these denim jackets. So when we would um, go to rehearsals or do the model fitting, you know, I would hear little murmurs of, oh, he just sewed buttons. Oh, oh who, you know about, oh, oh, the guy that just, he just sews buttons. He's, he just sews buttons. He just sews buttons. But out of maybe 50 designers, I got women's wear daily. And that's the Bible of fashion. So I stopped listening. I'm on my own journey. Not to take away anything that they're doing, but why dis discredit me? And um, Women's Wear Daily acknowledged that I was just sewing buttons. And I made money from that article. And it's, it's more to what I do than just sew buttons. And with that, we agree that you do a lot more than just sew buttons. And we are thrilled to have your show here and to have you here. And I thank you so much for the conversation and look forward to the opening later this evening. Thank you, Robert, for having me. And thank you for um, being a part of my journey. Thank you.